you were told he will never learn to walk he will never learn to speak so it's better if you immediately put him to an institution and give up being parents uh, and uh, i i did not i just listened to it and uh, accepted uh, what you said and i know you and morten went over to the place i think it was on fyn maybe on fyn uh, and uh, saw those children there and the whole place and you decided no he was overactive and uh, and very i i could see it for for every time i came i could see it more and more he was 24 hour work for you and your husband and especially driving the car what did you notice and when did you notice changes it's hard to go back and, and have a time frame because mm. you're so stressed so what did you notice uh, especially i remember in hornbeck um, he was a completely changed boy he was calm and he he was running with you i think every day but um, he was calm and he was very attentive he listened to what i said and was very very kind very a very loving person and resting in himself it was so fantastic i hope you're enjoying the podcast so far I want you to personally experience what I have experienced. I want you to be able to sit in the future, you know, 10-15 years from now and talk about how terrible things were for your child and how your child is now independent driving, um, having a job, no symptoms like stimming and tantrums and sleepless nights and eloping. If that's something you want to investigate further, go to barefootautismwarriors.com and download free guides to get started right now. If you're watching from YouTube, you can just uh, click the link below. If you're watching from my website as well, you can click free resources or the links below. But go to barefootautismwarriors.com and look for free resources to get started for free or contact me today so that we can start planning a strategy for you. This is a special episode for me because my special guest is my mom and uh, my mom is an eyewitness to the birth of my child the the damage to my child and the improvement of my child in his autism turnaround process and the reason why I wanted to bring my mom on the podcast is several several there are several reasons for that one is that when we had a conversation recently about what we remember she told me things and this has happened a lot that i had blocked out and had been in denial about simply because when you're in under a tremendous amount of stress you block things out that are too hard to handle and i feel that it's so important to document it and to remember it and for the moms who have children who are stimming having tantrums eloping running away aggressive risky behavior um, and moms that have um, children and grandparents where when you begin this process of changing your lifestyle and changing your diet you either get support from grandparents or puzzlement you know surprise or resistance from grandparents so i think this eyewitness story is important for for grandparents and for new moms with children who, who has autism to figure out and really prove how important it is to believe there's something you can do when everyone tells you there's nothing you can do 
and what it looks like from the outside. How do you support the family best as a grandparent? And what did you observe as a grandmom? So um, welcome to Eta, my mom. She's wearing some headphones that might be a bit scratchy at times, but we but we will take our chance with them and take a take a step back into the past when when you become a grandmom for the first time with with the recovered child. Can, can you can you recall when and how did you notice something was not quite right? Mm-hmm. Yes, <clears throat> yes, and uh, then I had to tell you something you couldn't know, because um, first of all, first of all, you expected to give birth to your child uh, at a certain time, and the whole system did too, but you, uh, you didn't give birth at the time you were put up to. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I remember that the... I went, so, so for people who don't understand, it, the baby was overdue. I went two weeks Yeah, two over weeks. the, the yeah. due date. Yes, and the midwife had uh, told you that uh, your child was okay and he was his weight was okay he was about three kilos or something like that uh, i don't know how they know these things but they do <laughs> so after two weeks over waiting over what we shall say you gave birth to your child and i was in jutland and your sister <clears throat> Ursula was two with her little boy who was one year old at the time, maybe even not one year. So we jumped into the car and uh, raced to Copenhagen over the islands and uh, came to the hospital uh, the day after you had given birth. And you were holding your little treasure and Morton was there too, and we all were so happy that everything was all right. Mm. And uh, we congratulated and enjoyed. And then we went back. As soon as I came back, I decided to call the hospital because the, he was wonderful but I could see he had no fat at all. Mm -hmm. And I know babies have to have fat. Yeah. It's wrong. Uh, and I saw these uh, legs and arms and the whole body with no, absolutely not a single gram. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called the, I called the hospital and got the <laughs> right. Know. <laughs> I did. I called the hospital and said I would like to talk to the people who were responsible for your birth. And uh, I said, have you examined this boy carefully? And they said, no, why? Why? Why should we? Everything is okay. And I said, no, everything is not okay. I have seen so many babies being born, uh, so I can tell you something is wrong. And now I ask you to, to uh, examine him carefully. Mm -hmm. And I did not tell you about it, because that's not what you want to hear as a newborn mother. It's not, uh, not good at all. And uh, I thought, then everything is okay. They will find out if if he has been uh, stabbed. Yeah, and uh, yes, and if he has suffered very much from hunger. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he did. I really think he did. 
and I think he still has the best that hunger inside of him somewhere. Mm. Yeah. Good point because sometimes he gets into this ravaging hunger. It's it's very balanced now but mm-hmm. I do think that that's true that that yeah. situation plus the fact that when I was pregnant and before I was pregnant I was extremely unhealthy. Mm. So I ate I basically lived on crisps, chips, fries, pizza, Coca-Cola. I ate tons of candy and they've proven that what you eat when you're pregnant is what your child will be will have as a preference. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, wow. Okay, yeah. so then, then what they, from yeah. your perspective? Next thing uh, happened uh, was that uh, I talked to you and uh, you told me they had hit him examined mm-hmm. they had found a yeah a cleft palate that yeah, like a whole, yeah 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 so so I thought all right so now this is the start now they will take very good care of him and find out mm-hmm. um but apparently they didn't at that occasion mm-hmm. they didn't as far as i know yeah. but i think as i said i think uh, this has a great importance for for bertram and what happened next was that they wanted to see if he needed surgery they said yeah. it would affect speech so they kept monitoring him for speech um but i managed to feed they said he wouldn't be able to uh, breastfeed but i managed i just battled with it and i managed to get him to feed immediately yeah uh, even though they said it wouldn't be possible because it can come out from the yeah. nose until yeah. it goes back yeah or, or until you've had surgery and i did not want surgery and i wanted him to have the milk Yeah. So we that was the first occasion of they say you can't breastfeed I'm going to prove them wrong. <laughs> yeah. And so he got the milk mm. from mm. me until he was four months old when mm. back then in two, 2000 uh, so in 99 mm. they had this idea and I don't know if the if the nurses were paid or whatever but they came out into the homes and told the moms to stop breastfeeding at age a month four mm. saying he needs uh, food and he needs uh, a bottle or he won't get enough nutrition that was not just me it was everyone yes and so i did what they told me because i was someone who did what doctors told me i was someone who did what mm. nurses told me i'd mm. never questioned anything at that point mm. so um i started giving him formula and um porridge which is another thing they said i should do mm. and this minute i did that he would just break out in horrific eczema like mm-hmm. whole body was inflamed yeah and then they gave yeah. him cortisone creams and medication and from then on he kind of deteriorated his health deteriorated yes, yes. Stool, yeah coughing mucus um ended up with an asthma spray because then they thought it was asthma We had several occasions of a whole night of having to hold him out the window because he couldn't yeah. breathe. Yes. And I didn't know back then it was the gluten and the dairy in that food. No. And, and it no. took years for me to realize that. Yes. But so from the outside, as he was growing up, he was meeting the milestones up until he was around 18 months and he got the thing that we're not allowed to talk about uh, publicly because we'll be closed down if we talk about that Mm -hmm. he was hospitalized um, he had a seizure he was blue foaming and we went with the ambulance to the hospital and when he came back from that hospital yeah it was like he was gone yeah And I don't want to take all of your speaking time. It's still a bit scratchy, that microphone. Mm-hmm. Thing, but anyway, mm-hmm. um, um, it was like he had islands of that old presence yes. when, from when he was meeting the milestones. And then he would disappear. Yeah. 
And what did that behavior look like from the outside when he was strange in the way that then led to his diagnosis many years later? Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. I I visited you on and off, and uh, when I was together with you, it was uh, I could see it was really really horrible because this boy um, he had to sleep a lot uh, during the day and. Um, when he was social, he was overactive and uh, and very, I, I could see it for, for every time I came, I could see it more and more. He was 24 hour work for you and your husband mm-hmm. so, and especially driving the car. I remember it Do was you remember episodes with that. Yes, I I remember uh, one <laughs> horrible day. We went to Helsingør to a big market to uh, yeah, the who it is a not supermarket. This this new building with all kinds of uh, uh, all kinds of. <laughs> <laughs> a mall, like a, a, a night would center, a center with yeah. a lot of many stores and many shops. It's and, a mall. Uh, yeah, some hall. And uh, we were all very nervous because we uh, all had this uh, child who, who nobody could make relax. So, um, first of all, we went to the toilet, you and I, and I think he was with Morton. My ex, yeah, my husband, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, afterwards we uh, found out that you had forgotten the key to the car, Mm -hmm. which is a symptom of stress. And we went to the toilet, but there was no (laughs) <laughs> no car key. And uh, Morton met us and, uh, and we were going to look for this. We didn't know what to do. And he said he had lost uh, Bertram. He was lost. He couldn't find him. And he ran up these stairs and down and looking and looking. And we went out to see if he had gone into the streets. And then uh, I, I think it was you or me who went to the office at the, this hall and there was the key. So we went back to the car and Morden sa- said, I don't know where Bertram is. And then I looked up store three, I think it was, there was a, a window open, but with a metal fence. And there he was standing, peeing out of this <laughs> place. And of course, it was funny, but it was also a picture. The whole scene was the absurdity. Yeah, and yes, and and nothing to do. Ah, so I understood. And every, sing- every single day was like that. And this is what yes. people might not understand, and even grandparents they visit they see mm. this yeah scenario and they see how stressed the parents are yeah. and how impossible the situation is because you really yeah. can't go anywhere but they don't see that this is actually every single day for years no These but parents. i could see it on you i could see how you suffered uh, sometime before that you told me that I think it must have been much earlier, much earlier. Um, You told me that you were told he will never learn to walk. He will never learn to speak. So it's better if you immediately put him to an institution. 
and gave up being parents. Uh, and uh, I, I did not. I just listened to it and uh, accepted uh, what you said. And I know you and Morten went over to the place. I think it was on Fyn, maybe on Fyn. Uh, and uh, saw those children there and the whole place and you decided no no we will take the responsibility and it was a longer process but then you started uh, you started uh, a, a cure for Bertram and you were very wise because you uh, incorporated the whole family. So that was the time of the brand Kjernesund Familie. What's that in English? Yeah, so I wrote, I wrote a book about that, but that was yes. later, way later. So that was in yes. 2008. I, yes. So when he was eight and the youngest... Melvin was, yeah, three years younger than yeah, that. Yes, so, so many things happened and uh, I felt so sorry for you both, both you and the father and of course Bertram, yes. And his brother, because he was so, there was no space for him, there was no time for him there was no mental capacity for him and he was just sitting there waiting for mm -hmm. some day yeah some miraculous change would happen mm -hmm. so that there would be space for him yeah but um when what from the outside you're <coughs> talking about a cure or an approach what did it look like from the outside and did you agree with all of it what did we do from a grandparent's perspective that that was different i uh, i i i knew that you were um, you were collecting so much knowledge and uh, you it was it was like a study at the university to find ways to help your child so i just listened actually and i saw and if i was asked about something i answered but i did not give my opinion at all only if asked because uh, and that is a, a thing which I have tried to do as a grandparent, but help in the way we are asked to help, if we can. You cannot always, but if you can, you you do what you are asked help to. And if, um, yeah, that's uh, uh, that is a very good advice for grandparents, I think, and parents. But so for, for many grandparents, birthdays, visits, it's where they get to spoil the kids and they give them candy. And the approach that we have had, and they feed them and they take them places and they go to the cinema, they go to the circus, whatever. Um, one of the things that we, we were quite, quite extreme, no TV, no gluten, no dairy, mm. no sugar, mm. no nothing no toxins mm -hmm. and um, fun story at a point some point we had parasites and yes. uh, we had to just like clean everything so we brought a bottle of vodka everywhere yes. and at the time he was on nicotine patches for his ADHD and it had a tremendous effect by the way but that's another story mm -hmm. for the day. So we, he went to his grandmom with a bottle of vodka and nicotine patches and his <laughs> tiny little rucksack. <laughs> and she was really skeptical. I remember her looking <laughs> like that. 
she came along she 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 eventually she was really supportive because she said i could see it working but what did what did that look like from the outside did you agree with all of it was it difficult did we seem extreme to you was it was it a a problem for for the family as such we didn't see each other much in those years mm. but when we did mm. just what what was problematic about it if anything I don't think there was a problem, only that I could not live up to the idols. I could not, and I uh, realized that. So it was like visiting uh, another culture, which is always very interesting. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I tried to... to uh, To, to do what I could. You told me a lot of things to do that I could not do, but mm. I tried. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> what couldn't you do? What was like out of out of reach? Yeah, I couldn't pay for it. Mm. It was very, very expensive to live like that. Mm. So that was not possible. And as you know, I had a big responsibility for your sister's children and both of them, but mostly one of them. Uh, so in a way, we were one big uh, family for small boys with different problems. <laughs> But I think it was I think it was very exciting and I followed you. You had uh, some visions and uh, what, I don't want to mention them, but when you got a new vision, I tried to back up about it completely. For instance, ho o pono pono. Do you remember that? I do. That was back in the um, in my new age days, and I I have since found out that that is demonic. It is a it's a twisted version of things that's in the Bible. Hmm. So I'm very against that now. But yeah. But what are so I do not recommend Ho'oponopono at all. No, I Or know. Anybody. I just mentioned that when you got a. Uh, yeah. An issue. I yeah. backed you up, and I followed you, and I tried to live after it in in the way w which was possible for me. So when you dropped it, I dropped it too. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> actually very tolerant of you. I oh, really yeah. appreciate that. Mm. From an outside perspective. Mm. How did you, because the diagnosis procedure in Denmark, I don't know if it's the same now, but back then it was about three, two to three mm. years. Yeah. Um, and we we began that process. He was around three to four years old when he got that diagnosis um, or when it's the whole process started. Mm -hmm. And when we started changing everything for him. Yeah, was, okay. yes. Um, How, how did you see changes happening from that boy that was not able to socialize and, mm -hmm. and um, was running away in danger, uh, hyperactive, mm. lining things up, um, not engaging? Like, what did you notice and when did you notice changes? It's hard to go back and, and have a time frame because mm. you're so stressed. So what did you notice? Uh, especially I remember in Hornbeck, um, he was a completely changed boy. He was calm and he, he was running with you, I think, every day. But... Um, He was calm and he was very attentive. He listened to what I said and was 
very, very kind, very, a very loving person and resting in himself. It was so fantastic. And I remember one, uh, one day in Hornbeck, he went out, he told us later, he went out very, very early in the morning into the wood and he brought his phone and he hid himself by a big trunk, which uh, it, it was a tree lying down and he put himself here, there and he put his telephone upon the trunk and then he recorded birds singing morning songs. And then he came in and told what he had done and it was wonderful to listen to all these birds. And so uh, he and I, we made a small theater in a sh shoe box <laughs> uh, and it was the play called The Nightingale. And he was assisting very, very simple paper figures. And he was assisting and uh, we made this play for, for Melvin and uh, he put his singing birds as a, as the music to the play. Oh, the soundtrack, yes. The soundtrack, yes. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful, wonderful. We shared many wonderful events together, yes. So, so he lived a, I think it was a 10 year stunt a uh, stint of stunt, whatever it's called, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, of a life without gaming, without entertainment, mm -hmm. without sugar, dairy, gluten, or anything like that. And I know that many grandparents say, oh, that's that's a shame. They can't participate. What They can't talk about the same things uh, with their peers, mm -hmm. about things they see on TV, games they play. Mm. What about birthdays? What about school? From the outside, because I know that for me it was so important that I never had any doubts that it was the right thing to do. But mm. what about you from the outside? What would you say to grandparents who feel that it's actually, it's a shame to do that? <laughs> oh, I will say you have to be very attentive to the person you are with, also a child, and to communicate, uh, not preach, but communicate and listen very much and answer and be serious, uh, serious, uh, serious about the relationship. And also that even if you know a lot much better, of course, than a child, it is so important to listen, so mm. important. Because if you listen, then the dialogue is natural. If you listen, the dialogue is natural and it is, uh, it is for both sides at the same level, if you understand. Yeah. Yes. What What would be your biggest, your best tips for moms mm. who are reluctant to go all in? Because as you have witnessed, it's not easy to mm -hmm. prove all these things. And it's not easy to stand up against doctors, no. uh, teachers. No. Experts who say this this child will never walk, this child will never be without support. Yeah. Um, and grandparents who are skeptical and working against parents who want to try these these types of interventions. What's your best tips for the skeptical ones, the scared ones? Um, now that we are on the other side and he has none of those symptoms left and he lives a completely mm. normal life. Mm -hmm and have he's proven proven it all wrong but mm -hmm. what would you say to those who don't have that to lean yeah. on yet yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think i would say that relation with your family is like 
all other relations. The same rules are for uh, the way you communicate with your family as in the world as such. The difference is that you feel so much. You feel so very, very, very much. And uh, that's okay, but, but you must be able to distinguish is this just my feelings uh, that I react on or am I, uh, am I uh, observant mm. and on level with the part I am together with? So, uh, and that is, uh, so you can use your family as becoming a much better uh, person by practicing holding back what should be held back and uh, only if you want to interfere, for instance, you have to ask. Mm -hmm. You yeah. have to ask, is it okay if I say so? Is it okay or would you rather that I don't come mm -hmm. with a proposal or something? Even that, I think you should ask. If you feel too much, ask. And and there's a lot of well in many in many families and in our family too. Mm. There's trauma. There's feelings of of abandonment. There's wounds. And then when there's a child coming into this whole context, yeah, with special needs. Mm -hmm. And with no filters at all, so that everything's just emphasized. There's more aggression, there's more noise, there's more demands. Um, the games that we play in families or the, the, the conflicts and the drama is also exacerbated. It's, it's mm -hmm. emphasized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So later in life, we're both later in life now. <laughs> yeah. Um, We're not young parents and we're not, we don't have young grandkids or young kids anymore. Mm -hmm. What would you, what would you have loved to know that would have made things more peaceful, maybe mm -hmm. not that you created any drama around my kids, but, but um, I know that I, at some point I felt, why is my family here supporting me all the time? Why mm -hmm. are they not taking over? Why? Why mm -hmm. don't they come and take this child and give me a break, for example? Yeah. Um, so from this perspective, looking back on that, what what would you say to the old me and the old you and to all the moms mm -hmm. who are feeling similar, mm -hmm. similar things? Yeah. I still would say the same because it has been a lesson for me. Uh, I think very much and have, I, have, I have always been thinking very much mm -hmm. and therefore I had this uh, for many many years I had this inside uh, conference with myself a lot uh, too much too much I should have asked more i should have asked more instead of thinking this and that and maybe oh, oh oh i'm afraid of that and and what can i do what can i do i should have asked even the little ones yeah how could how what would be better for you for instance but yeah. you don't do it because you 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 feel so responsible uh, as a grown up you must know uh, and uh, sometimes you pretend to know just to keep this role but give it up <laughs> and give yes, it up. but it's also overwhelming with all these behavioral issues mm -hmm. in, in the extreme phases was it also scary and overwhelming so that it's something that people tend to just stay away from like if someone's really yeah. seriously ill mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. those that are close 
to the family mm. can't deal with it and so they kind of disappear yes what do you mean by disappear um like leaving it so so rather than coming over taking over yeah. being part of it yeah yes there are situations where you know you can do nothing mm. there are situations and then you must just hope that you will have another opportunity mm. uh, and uh, try if if we are talking about people like me for instance uh, try not to torture yourself with guilt which is also you can uh, if you have a lot of guilt it can be a way of life and it can be uh, an occupation <laughs> to, to have guilt and i have a lot of guilt but i don't want it to uh, spoil the present yeah you have to be in the present and uh, now i'm very old i'm 76 and i will be 77 very shortly so i'm very old now and i'm so glad i have learned to distinguish uh, my feelings my problems with what others can deal with Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not talking about small children now. No. No. No, and also in families, we got to remember that all family members have their things to deal with. And, yeah. and that when we have grandchildren, the, the things that we've done, said, chosen, not chosen, is then expressed in the family dynamics as well. So sometimes for grandparents, it's their they're watching their children and all the 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 results of a whole life of choices yes <laughs> choices that we didn't make yeah in a matter like all all of a sudden we have all these people mm. mirroring things back at us and that oh, was yeah. overwhelming as well yes it is you know? yeah it is but um i the last thing i wanted to ask you was um from an outside perspective now with over 20 years of eyewitness stories to mm -hmm. connect was it worth it the 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 turn that we took and have you seen other children like he used to be growing up and do you have anything to compare with so, so question number one was it worth it all the changes that we made and two if you compare with other kids that had hmm. similar similar challenges what do you see i see that um, i have never seen anything done so well i have never never Thank you. really really <laughs> he's an incredible person now isn't he, he yes he is he's wonderful hmm. He's wonderful. I wonder why he doesn't have wings. He should have. I know. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. For, for him, he's he's got a job, um, driver's license, drives, he's self-sufficient, he's independent, um, social skills. He's, yes. he's he's finding his own jobs. He's, he's writing his... Yeah. He's going for job interviews, mm -hmm. he's contacting people without me knowing it. Yes. That's what he does with his music too. Yes. All the things, and physically as well, all mm. the things he said he wouldn't be able to do, he is doing and he's living yeah. a completely normal life. Yes. So that will be my message to moms and grandparents out there. Mm. Don't we need to turn every stone? Because my first ambition was simply to get him to sleep at night. I had no idea that he would ever be able to improve, nor did I believe it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So don't we need to turn every stone and remove every food mm -hmm. or lifestyle or toxin mm -hmm. or trigger in mm -hmm. order to give them the best possible outcome? Because if we look into the future and your child is 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 
We want them to be independent. We want them to、mm-hmm. be kind. We want them to、mm-hmm. not have fits of anger.、Yeah. Yes. We want them to have girlfriends, marriages, jobs,、mm-hmm. and be able to to drive a car, for example. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. I don't know.、Uh, What do you say in English? But he is persistent. He never gives up. Exactly. He never gives up. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> it's so true. He、yes. never ever gives up. And maybe、mm. that's the that's a beautiful like an end to this conversation. Yes. Yes. This is a story of never giving up. Right. Don't ever give up. Don't give up on your child. Don't give up on hope. Don't give up trying. Don't give、mm-hmm. up on your grandparents、mm-hmm. and grandparents. Don't ever give up on your children and your grandkids <laughs> and all their crazy ideas. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you so much, Ninka. I really hope you enjoyed this podcast, and that you will share it with a grandparent. You'll share it with a mom who's losing hope, and let this be a story of never giving up. And I don't want you to give up either. If you want to get started straight away, go to barefootoasisandwarriors.com and go to free resources. To download my free ebook about my journey, my five messages behind autism symptoms, or my picky eating guide. Or my grounding guide to get started with your healing process right now. I really hope you enjoyed this podcast, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.